Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to Empty Cloud Monastery. So tonight we're delighted to have with us Aya Soma to my right and Bhante Jayasar to my left, uh, and I'm Bhante Sudaso. Uh, so uh, this evening we'll be having a Sangha panel discussion on the topic of faith and doubt. Uh, so this was a topic which um, Aya Soma was speaking about uh, earlier at uh, tea time here at the monastery. Uh, so perhaps we can start by paying homage to the Buddha and then invite Ayasoma to begin with a few words on the topic. Namo dasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo dasa bhagavato All right, thank you for the invitation, Bhante. Um, it's always difficult to start, to be the first one to start the Sangha panel. <laughs> so maybe I'll pass it on to <laughs> Bhante <Jay. laughs> All right, faith and doubt, sure. Um, so as a typical Westerner who went through the the kind of transition um, into Buddhism, I was not a big faith person. I, I didn't want to hear about this thing called faith. I right? was like, oh, that's what like, you know, people from uh, Abrahamic religions, that's what they do. They have, you know, faith in things. And, um, you know, it, it, and this is fairly prevalent because you actually see a lot of teachers, especially lay teachers, don't like to translate the word sadda to mean faith. They translate it to mean confidence. And the deeper I've gone into the practice, the more I've realized that sadda, yes, confidence is part of sadda, but there is actual faith in Buddhism. This does exist. This is the, much to the chagrin of, of many convert Buddhists or people who don't want to hear about it or Stephen Batchelor or whoever. <laughs> <laughs> faith, is, faith is a very, very important part of the practice. Now, you know, the Buddha talks about faith followers and Dhamma followers. You know, uh, Dhamma followers, uh, which I count myself to be one of those, um, faith doesn't necessarily come easy. Faith has to kind of come from hard won experience and wisdom. And then you start to have so much confidence in the, the Buddha and the Dhamma and the Sangha that in a way that becomes a faith, right? You, like you, you like for, uh, to use myself for an example, right? Like I've, the practice has shown me the Buddha to be right for almost everything I've experienced. And so basically I have faith in the, the rest of the percentage that I haven't seen for myself, right? I give the Buddha the ultimate, the, the what do they call it? The, um, benefit the, doubt, of the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, I have faith. And even to become a monastic, I, I really, what I tell people is like, you really, in the end, it's a leap of faith. It's like, you don't know if it's going to work out, but it's something that you feel strongly for. Right? So, so this aspect of faith, you know, the, this, even if you want to call it quote unquote blind faith, um, you know, necessarily kind of having a belief in something that you can necessarily prove per se, this is an aspect of, of a spiritual life to have this, this kind of faith to, to have this trust that, there's just this wisdom that you don't know yet, right? There's this understanding that you don't know yet. 
And so it's perfectly okay to, you know, to have faith. And I've met people who are really strong um, uh, faith followers. You can just tell that they're just beaming with like this faith in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. Sometimes, honestly, I'm jealous of that. I was like, <laughs> especially in the early days, like, wow, how, how do they have this faith? But I think it's, you know, it, it depends on our proclivities and our habits and our karma and all kinds of things um, as to as to this, you know, this quality of faith. But for all of us, you know, if you look at the 37 uh, wings to awakening, right? The uh, Bodhipakya Dhammas, you have Sadda in there multiple times. Sadda is part of the path. You know, faith is part of the path. Um and well, like I said, some some of us are Dhamma followers and some of us are faith followers, but that doesn't mean that Dhamma followers don't develop any faith either. Faith is part of the path for all of us as we, you know, follow the noble eightfold path to awakening. So that's my start. Okay. Ayasama, do you want to pick up and run with it now? <laughs> okay, thank you, venerables. Yeah. Um Similarly to Bhakti Jay, I feel like every convert Buddhist that has a similar sort of story that we don't um, start as faith followers. So I can copy and paste everything that <laughs> Bhante has said in terms of um, how I got into practice. But it's so interesting because actually one of the residents, uh, lay residents here at Empty Cloud that just um, left today, a lovely uh, lady called... Uh, Hia, um, she actually yesterday described me as a faith follower. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she was very much surprised that I had doubt at the very beginning. Um, and I was very much surprised that she perceived me as um, a faith follower and um, that she was surprised that I had doubt at the very beginning. So it's quite interesting also how this can change you know um sometimes we are so wrapped up with um with our experience that actually um things might actually shift and we might not even <laughs> realize it too much until someone from the external from the outside points that out and i think that um that is the process personally what i really loved actually about um the teachings of the Buddha at the very beginning when I went to Santa Chittarama um, Monastery, that is a Thai forest monastery in the um, Ajahn Chah tradition in Italy, the only one that is um, present currently right outside Rome. Um, I actually picked up this book that wasn't even a Theravada book, it was a Zen book. And I still remember that I picked it up and it said something along the lines, when you think you've seen the Buddha kill the Buddha. And um, obviously it's not a literal, um, invitation to uh, kill a Buddha, um, but rather what it meant was um, what they mean by that in the Zen tradition is to essentially it's an invitation to kill the dogmas that we create in our own mind, not necessarily the ones that um, we think are present in religion, but rather what we think even you know enlightenment is. What what does it mean to be a Buddha? What does it mean to anything? Uh, what does it mean to be a stream enter? What does it mean anything that we encounter uh, within um, uh, our path as Buddhists? And I remember being blown away by the fact that, um, you know, there was actually a religion that not only invited questions, but actually invited you to question and to doubt um, <laughs> the teachings Um in, in such a sort of even extreme way, if you may. And of course, it was coming from Catholicism, uh, which on the other hand has many dogmas that um, one should take uh, with blind faith. So that was definitely something that I found very appetizing, but also the fact that um, once again, it was an investigation of mine. It was something that I actually had found very interesting when I was studying um, something completely unrelated to to buddhism which is marxism but what i actually found really interesting about the um, about marxism was the concept of the in italian you call it sobra struttura superstructure i think it's in in uh, english and what i found very interesting as an adolescent was 
once again, this idea that there was this superstructure in society that then created that, um, you may say, sense of self that was very much conditioned by arbitrary facts, you know, just the fact that I was born in Italy and that I was uh, born in a certain particular day and age and that there was a particular current and um, like religion present there, uh, culture and so forth, all of these things conditioned the way that I was thinking. And um, I had a kind of taken up those, those um, like that investigation of the superstructure rather than of Marxism. <laughs> and that kind of like stayed with me until I found the teachings of the Buddha. And I was like, oh, wow, this is a way not only to become aware of the superstructure that one, you know, grows up with, but to actually realize, um, to pierce through it and to be able to throw it, throw it away, to toss it away. Um, how very fascinating. And so that in a, in a way is basically um, what I call these days a healthy doubt rather than skeptical doubt, which is instead a hindrance of mine. It's a hindrance that um, we can have in meditation practice and also just in our path as practitioners. And that is very much um, essentially the opposite of faith. Um, it's the <laughs> the obstacles that we create on the path of going like, hmm, well, I don't know really if this thing works. So how about I do what I've done so far that definitely did not work. <laughs> and that is, um, yeah, usually how we go about it. And we can lose so much, so much time in um, cultivating and fueling that kind of skeptical doubt. But instead the doubt, the useful doubt, the beneficial doubt that instead we, we have in Buddhism is this um, constant, constant investigation of what we think, well, what we think we are, what we think, um, you know, the, our experience of reality is, what we think um, the teachings of the Buddha are. And through this process of investigation, there are so many different tools um, that both the Buddha gives us and also the different traditions that have kind of evolved out of the teachings of the Buddha. We can really even understand, um, they can pinpoint some, some ideas, some so, uh, sense of identities that we have or concepts that we've never questioned that we don't even realize. I remember when I first had done um, meditation practice with Ken Mudralma, she's a Tibetan bhikkhuni, and um, she was guiding us through Mahamudra meditation, which is a type of vipassana meditation in, in Tibetan Buddhism. And one of the questions that you're supposed to ask yourself um, is, where is the mind? Is it inside of myself or is it outside of myself? And I remember outside of myself, I was like, wow, it never occurred to me. <laughs> Why do I think it's inside of myself? Just something so simple as that. There are so many assumptions that we have in the world and we never question them. So when we get to the teachings of the Buddha, we just assume that we even know what the mind is. We assume what consciousness is. We assume even what a body is. We assume what emotions are. We assume, we assume everything. Um, and instead, we have we start doubting skillfully. We start skillfully doubting um, all of our internal dogmas, and that personally, this way of eradicating essentially these dogmas um, has definitely created a lot of faith. And I think that's what he was was seeing. I was like, yes, the Buddha knew what he was talking about, and so did his disciples. And this, um, yeah is really a, a path that the more we eradicate all these dogmas and the sense of self, the more we, we go towards the cessation of suffering. So it's all there, it's experiential and it lets us just come and see. So this is what comes to mind. <laughs> yeah, so I feel like a lot of uh, really important stuff has already been said. Um, but one thing which which I would like to add to all of this is uh, there's two sutta references on the topic of faith, which I've always found really, really useful. Uh, one is uh, something I'd mentioned in a recent sutta study where the Buddha defines faith as uh, faith in uh, Tathagata Bodhisattva. Uh, so faith in the uh, awakening of uh, the Tathagata, faith that the Buddha was an awakened being. Uh, so this is defined as one of the critical qualities of mind for a successful Buddhist practice. Uh, because if we have faith that the Buddha was awakened, 
then that means we have one, we have faith that awakening is possible, which is very important. Uh, many people don't believe that awakening is possible. Uh, they don't even necessarily believe that, they don't even necessarily have a concept of what awakening is, uh, let alone a belief that it's possible. Uh, or they might think that awakening is something that only certain very special beings can do. Uh, but so starting with the idea that the Buddha was an awakened being, uh, it's first bringing up the possibility of awakening, the uh, concept of what awakening is, uh, and the fact that it's something which can be attained, it's something that can be reached. Uh, but it also gives one a, a reason to have faith in the Dhamma. Uh, so the Dhamma here meaning the teachings of the Buddha, which describe a path to awakening. Uh, so this also is, is then a necessary part for uh, sincere Buddhist practice. Uh, we need to have confidence, we need to have uh, sincere conviction that the Dhamma is worth following because it leads to awakening and was, was taught by an awakened being. Uh, so this is defined as, as one of the, the most valuable things one can have in this life is, is faith in the awakening of the Buddha. Uh, and uh, coming to that point of faith, uh, and different people have their own paths, so some people are, are born into Buddhist families and from the time they're very young, they're taught uh, that the Buddha was an awakened being and that this is something uh, highly praiseworthy and valuable and, and trustworthy. Uh, so they have a, a faith which is built up in them from the time they're very young. Some people have a certain innate faith, uh, which can only really be explained as coming from past lives. Uh, so some people, they uh, just see a Buddha image or they hear a fraction of a, a sutta and uh, there's just this, this, this immediate sense of like, oh, this is infinitely profound, timeless wisdom by someone who had a unbelievably deep understanding of the true nature of reality. Uh, so there's this kind of instant faith uh, which is arising upon some even just very very minor or small contact with Buddhism. Uh, so, for example, I, I know of some people who, they didn't really know anything about Buddhism, but they just saw a Buddha statue one day, uh, or they saw an image of the Buddha one day, and there's just this immediate faith that this was some a representation of some incredible teacher and then that inspired them to then begin investigating buddhism and to become a practitioner uh, or people who hear little fragments of the suttas or little quotes from the buddha and again there's this immediate recognition of like oh these are the words of an awakened being these are the words of an incredibly profoundly wise uh, spiritually developed individual uh, and this this is something that needs to be explored um, but for, for many people, faith is something which develops gradually over time. Uh, and it develops through mm, studying the Dhamma, so studying the teachings of the Buddha, reflecting deeply on them. It comes through practicing the Dhamma, so practicing the Noble Eightfold Path uh, and seeing the results that come from it, the benefits that come from that practice. Uh, and so one starts to develop a faith based upon reason and experience. Um, and this is a very strong kind of faith. Uh, so all of these kinds of faith actually can be quite strong. Uh, but the faith which comes through reason and experience tends to be particularly strong because it's something which is very hard to break. Uh, it's very hard to counteract. So if one's faith is, is just coming from what one's parents taught one, well, that can be strong, but it can also be, be broken. Uh, if you encounter some logic that seems more rational or you have some experience that makes you um, skeptical or or maybe someone has, they're, they're taught to have faith in the Buddha, but they never really learn the Dhamma, uh, then their, their faith can be mm, a bit fragile, uh, strong, uh, but fragile, like glass. Uh, strong, but if you hit it just right, it will all shatter. Uh, so similarly, faith which which lacks reason and experience is, uh, is like that. It seems strong, but it can, it can shatter very easily. Um, and uh, this kind of innate faith, 
Now, this is a bit stronger. Uh, again, it's something which is uh, probably built up through past lives. Um, so it has a bit of strength in it and that it's coming from past lives. Uh, but if it's not bolstered through reason and experience, uh, then also it, it can fade in time. Um, it's not permanent. Nothing is permanent. There's an interesting line in the suttas where uh, a layman wanted to make an offering uh, to the sangha, and and but he, he said he wouldn't be able to do it right away. He need he needed to wait a week. So he asked Mahamogalana, like, can you make sure that I remain alive and full of faith for the next week so I don't miss this opportunity to make this offering to the Sangha? And Mahamogalana says, well, I can make sure you stay alive, but only you can make sure you keep your faith. <laughs> and I found this so cute. Like Mahamogalana, who is supposed to be the person with the most powerful uh, psychic abilities uh, besides the Buddha. And he said, like, I, I can't guarantee your faith, sorry. I can keep your body alive, but only you can keep your faith alive. Uh, so I find this a, a very interesting statement. Like, ultimately, each one of us needs to uh, pay attention. Like, what nourishes our faith uh, in the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha? Uh, and uh, as opposed to what, what weakens it, what damages it? Um, and ultimately, it, it is, in fact, reason and experience that gives us the deepest faith in, in the Dhamma. Uh, and actually, the, the ultimate faith in the Dhamma is when you start with innate faith from past lives. You're raised in a Buddhist family, which um, drives it deep into the mind from the time you're born. And you study the Dhamma deeply, comprehend it deeply, and practice it deeply. Uh, then you're getting all of these kinds of faith built up in the mind. So reason and experience, these are, there's actually properly speaking two different kinds of faith. So the faith that comes from reason is you study the Dhamma and you recognize the deep wisdom contained within the Dhamma. Uh, and that gives you some, some faith that it's real, some faith that it's genuine, some faith that it's true. And faith coming from experience is when you practice the Dhamma, you apply the, the trainings of Sila, Samadhi and Panya, and you experience the, the benefits and results that come through practicing. And therefore, there's the faith that comes through direct experience of uh, the results of the Buddha's teachings. So again, optimally, we want to to stack these different kinds of faith because the the uh, builds up the greatest strength. Uh, it's like alloying metal. Iron by itself is is pretty good, but you alloy it with with tin and and other metals, and you have stainless steel, which is much better than iron. So in the same way, if you have only one of these kinds of faith, it's good. But if you alloy it with, with multiple kinds of faith, then it will be much stronger. Uh, it'll be much more difficult to, uh, to break. Um, and another interesting thing that, that's from the suttas, there's a few places in the suttas where the Buddha talks about the causal basis for the arising of faith. Like what conditions help one to, to cultivate faith, uh, which help faith to arise. There's one interesting sutta where the Buddha says, uh, when one experiences dukkha, then from that dukkha can arise faith. And I always found this such a peculiar line, uh, like suffering, suffering leads to faith. How is this possible? What could this possibly mean? Normally in the suttas, we see things like suffering leads to confusion and misery and torment and more suffering. Or in a few places, we see the, the line, suffering can have one of two results, um, either more suffering or the beginning of a spiritual quest. Uh, and, and that I, I relate to quite strongly because uh, for me, it was a, a recognizing the suffering of existence. So this, this deep recognition of existential suffering uh, was one of the major triggers that led me to a spiritual quest. Um, but in a few places, the Buddha says, uh, suffering can also result in faith. Uh, so faith in what? Uh, well, first off, when you really deeply experience suffering, then you have deep faith in the first noble truth. Uh, nobody needs to convince you that suffering exists. <laughs> you know it exists. You're quite confident about that. Uh, and uh, if your experience of suffering is deep enough, you can also recognize that it's universal. 
that it's not just poor me who just somehow got the short end of the stick in life. I got shafted by this horrible life, but everybody else is having a great except me. No, you recognize this is suffering. And this is something which everybody experiences to one degree or another. This is a basic characteristic of life. So if your experience of suffering is deep enough, you can recognize its universality. Uh, and if you pay close attention to it, you can also recognize that it's causal. It's conditional. It's not something which just like randomly appears out of nowhere, but it comes and goes with causes and conditions, just like everything else. And if you reflect on the causal nature of suffering, then you naturally can conclude that there must be a way to remove it. That if you change the causes and conditions, then the suffering can diminish and even disappear. Uh, and then there, there's the sense of like, well, then there's things I can do which lead to a diminishing and possibly even a complete transcendence of suffering. So one may not necessarily know the Dhamma, one may not necessarily know the path of practice yet, but a deep experience of suffering can give you some sense of at least the first three noble truths, and some sense that the fourth noble truth does exist, even if you're not quite sure what it is yet. Uh, so this is, as I think, possibly what the Buddha is referring to when he makes this otherwise somewhat cryptic remark uh, that uh, dukkha can be a, a causal basis for the arising of faith. Um, so I think that at this point, I'd, I'd like to pass it on to one of my fellow venerables if they'd like to talk a bit more on these topics. Thank you, Bhante. Uh, Actually, maybe Bhante Jay can address this since it was related to what he had uh, mentioned okay. earlier. So, so there's actually a few different questions yeah, we could take. So. Um, so this one for uh, Bhante J, it says, my experience has been that there is so much emphasis on meditation practice that it's very easy to remove the Buddha from the Dhamma. Therefore, that is why faith is not part of the conversation. Do you want to say something about this? Mm. Let's see, meditation. <clears throat> well, yeah, well, some people who are who are i don't want to say converts because they might not actually be buddhist converts yet but people who are kind of playing with buddhist practices kind of exploring kind of you know everybody's on their own journey and there's lots of different kind of people exploring buddhism in their life in a lot of different ways um and some people are just not ready to hear a lot of the other stuff, but they, they're they connected to meditation, right? They don't want to hear about sila. They don't want to hear about more commandments because they're already have PTSD from the 10 commandments, right? They don't want to hear about all this other stuff. They just want to hear about meditation because their anxiety or whatever, right? So, that, so that's where they start <laughs> off from. <clears throat> that's where they start out. And, you know, some people, that's where they end. And other people will go deeper. They'll want to hear more about this. You know, uh, some people will have that, uh, like, you know, that experience of lots of dukkha, right, in their life. And that will propel them further. Well, what is, let me, you know, experience this teaching deeper. Let me go further. Let me see that, you know, there's more than just the meditation. There's a meditation you know, very, very clearly in the suttas, you can see that what, what we understand to be quote unquote meditation is only at most a third of the practice, right? The, the practice as a whole in total is a full vehicle for you to transform your mind and your experience, right? And only taking part of that vehicle is not going to give you the full experience. It will, will be beneficial, but it won't give you the full experience. And so, yeah, so that's why people are not, people don't want to hear. The, one of the biggest issues, and Ajahn Chah, I'm going to bring up Ajahn Chah, because Ajahn Chah is like always right. <laughs> Ajahn Chah said something to the effect of, when you're teaching the Dhamma in the West, do not dumb down the Dhamma. Right? Chah, and what I see is that a lot of teachers dumb down the Dhamma, or they feel like, well, my people, they, they don't want to hear this, so maybe I'll say it in a different way, or I don't want to, you know, and 
to my benefit or my detriment, I, I just, I'm totally against like if some, even if they don't want to hear it, I'm going to tell them the way it is. It's just like, I, I don't, I feel like it's better that they know the truth and maybe not like it <laughs> than kind of be led along until they reach the point where like, Oh wait, but they all said this and that's not how it is. Right. So I think it's very, very important for anybody who shares the Dhamma to not sugarcoat it, not cherry pick it, tell it, say it all. And then let that gives the people who are listening the option to figure out where they are and what they're going to do. Great. That was lovely. Yeah. yeah when you said uh, don't sugarcoat it and don't cherry pick it, I thought of maraschino cherries. No maraschino cherries where right. it's yeah. like a, they hollow out a cherry and then like fill it with sugar. And <laughs> so that that's actually what a lot of accommodated dhamma is like. It's it's kind of like somebody took the dhamma and then hollowed it out and filled it with candy. And then you don't actually have the dhamma anymore. You just have the shell of dhamma filled with junk, mm. junk food. It has a very low nutritional value. Yeah. Well, actually <laughs> zero. Maraschino cherries have literally zero nutritional value. Um, anyway, did you want to say something more on that or should we take some of these no, questions? I think we can go with them. So we have two related questions here. So AS asks, can we see doubt interlaced with the other hindrances? And Kristen asks, how does one distinguish between doubt as encouraged by the Buddha, Kalama Sutta, versus doubt as one of the five hindrances? Ayasama, would you like to talk on this? Um, sure. Well, doubt um, in the hindrances, I think I spoke a little bit about it earlier already. Um, so doubt in the hindrances is essentially questioning um, whether or not what we're doing is useful, is beneficial. It actually will bring us to awakening or even like, what is the point of like looking at my breath, like watching my breath, uh, in breath and out breath? You can easily start going, this is so stupid, this is so silly, come on, like, um, rather uh, go and have a beer at the at the pub, it would be a lot more fun, etc, etc. Or was the Buddha really awakened? Who was the Buddha anyway? Um, did why practice uh, the teachings of the Buddha and not the practice the teachings of someone else? Uh, there's especially now in, in America, there are so many different random things, the law of attraction, the law of like, I don't even know what. We had a friend um, uh, who, a delivery person this today that actually was very knowledgeable about all the different theories. And so he arrived here and he asked us like what we were doing and then uh, spent five minutes about all the different theories that are out there. <laughs> And um, yeah, you can really get so lost in um, in samsara in terms of thinking, why am I doing, why have I picked this theory out of all these other theories? Um, or why, you know, if you're not born in Asia or not born in a Buddhist culture, you are you can go, I did that myself, actually. It was like, well, I actually don't even know Catholicism, really. <laughs> Maybe I should investigate first, like, my religion of birth uh, before actually taking this other religion from the other part of the world um, as a working hypothesis, blah, 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 blah. And essentially, you can spend a whole, like, meditation period or your entire life just questioning and not doing anything. Um, but the, um, the useful doubt that I was talking about earlier is actually, since we we're talking about Ajahn Chah, one of my favorite stories of Ajahn Chah is um, there was a Meiji, so um, um, eight or 10 preset um, female monastic at um, his monastery that at a certain point decided that, you know, this was a bit of a waste of time so that um, she actually really believed in Jesus um, after all. So <laughs> she was like, all right, see you all. Never am <laughs> going to the Christians. And uh, all the bhikkhus um, who knew her were, you know, heartbroken and shocked. And so they go to Ajahn Chah and they're like, wow, she's lost her mind. Uh, we need to stop her. She really like, um, you know, is rejecting all the teachings of the Buddha, the truth, and she's going to the Christians, like, please do something. And, <laughs> and Ajahn Chah said, 
maybe she's right. <laughs> and everyone was shocked because they weren't expecting Ajahn Chah to say maybe she's right. And um, the whole point of that teaching was once again to create the conditions. It was a skillful means to create the conditions to, mm, yeah, uh, allow the bhikkhus to to start questioning what were they even believing in themselves like what is it why are we so sure what is the factors through which we we believe in something you know actually there is a there is bill's question i don't want to steal your question but <laughs> um who but i want to address a little bit this as well in uh, what i'm about to say uh, so bill says in the buddha's words chapter two bringer of light section to the buddhist conception and birth the buddha talks how he walked how he walked is this a point of faith that an infant walked are the sutras to be taken literally and i want to just say something about the sutras to be taken literally in the way that obviously we have the teachings of the buddha that have come to us um, through the oral tradition and now we have them in writing right and um it's so interesting because a lot of times we get very Mm, there are all these debates. Well, was were these even like the the teachings of the original Buddha, um, or is the oral tradition reliable? And da -da 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 -da. Uh, but actually, what comes to mind lately, I've been um, kind of using this as a bit of a con. Uh, the words that were reputed to be from Socrates, so someone who has nothing to do with uh, <laughs> with Buddhism or India, uh, but someone I think around contemporary yes. more or less right of mm -hmm. the buddha mm -hmm. um but in, in uh -huh. but yeah in the western hemisphere and actually socrates was very disappointed about um writing uh, becoming a new form that was prevalent and actually in fact he refused to write anything and the reason that we even have uh, the teachings of socrates available were because plato uh, decided to to write them down paradoxically um but <laughs> um a certain point like a while back it occurred to me i was like why was actually socrates opposed to to writing as a medium and if i remember correctly his point was essentially that uh, the form the writing form gave um an appearance of knowledge to the person who was using who was getting the teachings who was receiving the teachings um from so because they would see them in writing they would stop investigating the mm -hmm. subject matter um so they thought that they understood they thought that they knew but in reality they just had an intellectual understanding of something and um they wouldn't spend much time investigating it as opposed to the oral tradition by default was actually a medium that was meant to um be rather than just copy and paste <laughs> rather than just a transcription or um yeah or verb verbatim you say verbatim verbatim mm -hmm. uh rather it was a way of transmitting um the truth or like a piece of knowledge in a way that you were sure that the person in front of you was actually understanding the subject matter so i found this very very fascinating um especially if you think of the buddha um i would i also search one was actually the the writing blah, 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 and usually it's ascribed to uh, 200 years or so after the buddha that writing actually was established in india but they also say that there was also proof that there was actually forms of writing way ahead of the Buddha. It was just not a medium that was used um, as much. And you can think, well, like the Buddha, you know, usually Samasam Buddha comes to this world in, uh, <laughs> in like sort of the perfect conditions, right? Uh, so if we take this as a working hypothesis, then 2,500 years ago, there were the perfect conditions in India. And the perfect conditions were also the oral tradition rather than going to ancient Rome, I don't know, and like in a time where in Greece, um, where there was writing, uh, or maybe actually even in ancient India, you could have said, well, how about we transcribe these? So we make sure that uh, those people, um, you know, in the West <laughs> 2,500 years from now will have more faith in the teachings uh, that I you know, 
that I shared. I think actually I'm starting, this is more of a, something that have appeared in my mind that I want to share. I think that actually that was intentional and that the Buddha in fact um, used the oral tradition or to encourage us to use that questioning mind, to nurture that, um, yeah, doubting mind, skillful doubting mind, and truly understand uh, what is said in the teachings. And that is, in fact, um, said over and over again throughout the suttas in the Kalama Sutta, but also in the Sandaka Sutta. Uh, the Buddha mm -hmm. says, in fact, that some things um, that are, you know, if someone is a traditionalist, some things will be, um, transmitted properly and some things won't be transmitted properly. And so if we just rely verbatim on whatever is transmitted to us, maybe some things we will practice properly, but some others we won't practice properly because essentially we're not even investigating what the hell we are practicing. Um, but rather this constant questioning is something really healthy that then nurtures faith in um, in the Buddha. So anyway, this is what I wanted to, to share. Maybe the other venerables... I just wanted to add one thing. Um, <clears throat> I don't see anywhere in the suttas where the Buddha encourages doubt. It's usually seen as a hindrance. Um, what I would say in the Kalama Sutta, the Buddha encourages is questioning and investigation. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the Buddha is like, of course, you're in your you, your doubt because you keep hearing all these teachings. You don't know. You have to see for yourself. So it's more about a, a questioning and investigating. Right? Mm -hmm. The Buddha says, when you hear something, don't automatically accept or reject it, but then ponder on it and investigate it for yourself. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, that's I just wanted to add that. Yeah, I mean it's semantics. So yes. then we can. <laughs> but this is why I like. I think words are important, and and if people can be well, this kind of doubt or that kind of doubt or this, you know, and, and <clears throat> so I think that. If you kind of stick to the suttas and you and you anchor it to a Pali word, then you, you're less confused. Yeah, similarly, this this is a distinction that needs to be made, and I think where where the confusion comes up, and and this is actually a source of a lot of confusion uh, in uh, uh, the Buddhist world, and especially in the West, where we're getting all the different Buddhist traditions from all the different Buddhist countries are all arriving at about the same time. A major source of confusion is that words from the Theravada traditions are being translated using the same words as completely different terms from the Mahayana tradition are being translated. So a great example of this is the word enlightenment. Um, so in the Theravada tradition, the word enlightenment is sometimes used as a translation of words that mean complete awakening. So words like sambodhi uh, or words like uh, uh, vimuti or nibbana. So words which we, we correlate to the highest awakening. Uh, whereas in the Mahayana tradition, the word enlightenment is commonly used to translate words that have a more simple meaning of like a realization or a moment of insight. Mm -hmm. So this has led to a lot of confusion where uh, you say the word enlightenment to a Theravada practitioner and they'll think it means one thing. You say it to a Mahayana person and they think it means something quite different, much more mundane and ordinary and everyday. Uh, so this is just one example, but actually the word doubt is another great example of this. So the word doubt is uh, used very heavily, especially in the, the Chan traditions, the Zen traditions of Mahayana. And actually, it's used in the sense of the this inner spur to question and analyze and investigate something. And in fact, in the Zen tradition, there's a saying, uh, great doubt leads to great faith, mm -hmm. uh, which is the same idea. Like it's, it's doubt not in the sense of uh, skepticism that wants to reject things, but rather doubt in the sense of, I'm not quite sure what this is, so I'm going to investigate it and analyze it until I know for sure. Uh, so that's more how the word doubt is, is used in the Mahayana traditions. Um, and that also is how I think that, like when Ayasama was speaking about doubt, I think, please correct me if I'm wrong, I think that's more the way that she was using it. Yeah. Uh, whereas in the Theravada tradition, commonly we use the word doubt to mean skepticism, this mind which is like, ah, this this is all a bunch of, of nonsense, a bunch of <laughs> woo-woo, hooey, jibber-jabber, I'm not into all of that. 
uh, I just believe in money and uh, fame and success. And well, actually, that's also a belief, by the way. Um, but it's, uh, again, it's a different usage of the same word. So we do need to be careful about that. And I think, I can't remember the name of the sutta, but there's actually a sutta where the, the Buddha um, invites us precisely not to fixate on uh, one particular word, but rather communicate more with definitions. So, because mm. there might be people that call, you know, this a glass, this a vessel, this a cup, this whatever the thing. And then we're like, no, this is not a cup. This is not a vessel. This is just a glass. And we can get very confused, but rather always um, investigating what is the actual, also there, <laughs> investigating. And there's always uh, the process of investigating what are we actually using in terms of definitions. Um, also in the Mahayana tradition, we realized that a lot of times, for example, arahant, uh, it does been actually tradition, mm -hmm. arahant, the word arahant, that we tend to think that only means one thing. <laughs> Instead, um, apparently in the Tibetan tradition, when you actually see the definition, they use arahant to um, talk about non-returner um, in, um, in Theravada terms. So we can have very strong, big fights with people, <laughs> stabbing them with words, <laughs> the harsh words. And uh, just because we're like, oh, you're, you know, you're clearly not Buddhist. What is this kind of thing that you're practicing, pretending to be a Buddhist? So you don't even know what an arahant is, or you think an arahant is an enlightened being, blah, 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 blah. But then we're actually talking about the same thing. And so coming back to Bill's question, um, so he's talking about uh, one of the uh, elements of the traditional story of of the the Buddha. Um, so one of the elements of the story of the Buddha is that when the Buddha to be, so we call him the, the Bodhisattva at that point, uh, when the Bodhisattva was born, uh, it said that he, uh, first off, it said that he emerged from the side of his mother's abdomen, um, rather than the more traditional way that people get born, which is through the uh, genitals, um, so through the unless side, unless you're Eve in Adam and Eve, <laughs> or unless one is born through surgery, through C-section, um, that's another way that you can be born without passing through the genitals. Um, and it said that uh, so after he emerged from the side of the abdomen, uh, that then first the devas washed his body, like one like shot cool water and another shot warm water to wash the Buddha's Buddha to be's body. Um, and it said that then the Bodhisattva um, stood up and said, I am the supreme being in, in all the universe, like no one is superior to me, uh, and this will be my last birth. And it said he took seven steps, and with every step, lotus flowers blossomed under his feet. I'll be perfectly honest with you. I find this all very cute. Um, and honestly, I, I don't personally take it particularly literally. Um, I think parts of it might actually have literally happened. Um, I think part of it might be metaphorical representations of the, the incredible spiritual purity of the development of the Bodhisattva over hundreds of lifetimes. Some elements are actually quite believable, like the part about devas washing the newborn baby. Actually, I think that's that one probably actually did happen. Um, the one about... Um, uh, flowers blossoming under the, the baby, that one also, I'm, I'm pretty much on board with. That one seems pretty likely <laughs> too. Uh, but the one about the, the baby saying that he's the supreme being in all the universe and that this will be his last birth and so on. Maybe, but it's, there's a little bit of conflict there with the later accounts of the Buddha's life where actually the Buddha didn't really have any clue what awakening was or what spiritual practice was. And so, it is a little bit odd that we have this the story of an infant basically declaring that the infant already knows for sure it's going to become a samasam buddha um is it possible yeah sure it's possible um is it necessary to have faith in that particular story in order to be a practicing buddhist no uh, again the important thing with faith in the buddha is to target the bodhisattva so that doesn't have anything to do with the first um what is it, 35 years of the Buddha's life? You don't need to have faith in any of those stories. 
You just need to have faith that the Buddha was awakened. That's the critical element of faith in the Buddha. Not necessarily the number of steps he took and the number of lotus flowers that blossomed under his feet after he was born. Not necessarily which anatomical part of his mother's body he emerged from. Um, not the temperature of the water that the devas did or did not spray at the body. None of that has anything to do with the necessary components of faith, in my opinion. Question. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> well, just to, to say real quick, actually, I think something like that is something that would actually be beneficial to like a strong faith follower. I think that's like a faith follower thing. But the other thing I wanted to say is, I, I'm trying to say this, in the Buddha's words, that's Bhikkhu Bodhi's things, is... is is Bhikkhu Bodhi, I assume, referencing, what is it, Majjhima Nikaya, The Amazing Tales? Is that where this is coming from? That might be where it's coming I from. That's, I don't yeah. think that, is there any places in the suttas other than Amazing Tales where you get that story of the Buddha walking with a lotus? I don't think so. I it's just from that I one am. spot yeah. that's interesting. Um, it There might be one other place, but it, it is one of these extremely rare things in the suttas. And generally speaking, by the way, if there's something which appears in only one or two places in the entire Pali Canon, then you need to handle it a bit more carefully um, because some things appear hundreds and hundreds of times, and you can be pretty certain that that's not coincidental. But when something appears just once or twice, you can, you can be a little more careful about adopting it wholesale without careful investigation first. And also, if, if you're really not sure about something, then just set it aside for now and keep studying the Dhamma, keep practicing the Dhamma. And maybe later on in a few months or a few years, you can go back and, and look at that thing you set aside and have a look again. What is this? Does this, does this really fit into everything else I've been studying? I guess the only thing else I would add is if if you look at most world religions and, and things over time, the founders of the religions tend to become more deified and there mm. tends to become more like, for instance, like you look at the suttas, there's no, the Buddha was not a prince. There's like a lot of like the, you know, the four sites and all these kind of things that we attribute to like the main, um, the traditional stories of the Buddha are not there. Right. There are things that have kind of like been uh, exaggerated in a way later in, and maybe they had to do that to fight against the Brahmins or something. <laughs> you know, they had to do it for a variety of reasons. But, yeah, I, I agree with Bonte. Like, I, I don't know if it's real or not, but it doesn't really, for me, have any bearing on my practice one way or the other. Yeah, I recall years ago, many years, so I actually don't remember who the author was, but there was a Buddhist scholar who hypothesized that that particular account of the Buddha's birth was inserted many years after the Buddha's passing, and it was inserted by either by Brahmanists um, or by people who were trying to convert Brahmanists. And the idea was that it was trying to present the Buddha as an innately pure being mm -hmm. from the moment he was born. And actually the thing about him emerging from the side of the mother rather than through her genitals was again, this idea, this non-Buddhist concept, but Brahmanical concept that women are inherently impure. Mm -hmm. So you can't possibly have a spiritual being coming out of a woman's genitals. Mm -hmm. So it's like, well, he must have come out somewhere else. And that's where you get the whole virgin birth too. Like, you know, the elephant and the... Okay, maybe we should go oh, to the. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, this is what you can. This is... We're opening up Pandora. World uh, history, box. world <laughs> religious stuff is interesting. There's lots of stuff. Okay. What's hmm? up? Spontaneous. spontaneous. Yeah, so spontaneous, spontaneous birth, birth, I'm birth, actually birth. fine with. So, but the the topic of of being spontaneously born is, I think we're veering a little off topic yeah. here. But that that's a fun one, and I'm actually there's, totally fine with that. There's also um, uh, beings. Can remember their past life at conception and in their mother wombs and at birth. And I think the Buddha was one of these. Mm. There's like four types of remembering past life at the birth stage. Yeah, so there is, there is a sutta that describes these four types of people. So I've also thought about this that it actually is possible that at the moment of birth the bodhisattva still had the memory that he'd been practicing as a bodhisattva for countless lifetimes. So he still had the memory of like, 
oh, just a moment ago, I was in Tusita heaven and I was a bodhisattva and I was just about to go down to the human world in order to begin my last life. But then he forgets. Yeah, like a few moments later, he forgets and, and his mom and all the attendants are like, well, that was weird. And then life proceeds. That's also possible. I thought about that as well. Um, but yeah, it, honestly, these are the sorts of things which to me, it's just kind of a non-issue. Whether the story is accurate or not actually doesn't have any bearing whatsoever on my faith. Yeah. So Facebook user says, faith in what exactly? Does someone who knows through experience that aspirin takes away their headache have faith in the aspirin? Is that considered faith? If I feel more at peace after meditating for a while, is that considered faith in the Dhamma? One of you like to speak about this? I think this is good for Bhante Jay. So, um, yeah, actually, you don't really know. If you've never had aspirin before, you just know from this. Actually, this brings up a point I wanted to make about the Buddha and faith. It's like most people, like the people who are converts, right, who are not born Buddhists, you kind of like to even decide to even start looking at Buddhism. There's a little bit of a faith there. There's like, what? Well, I hear good things about this Buddha and these like monks, like Dalai Lama seems pretty cool. Like, you know, this might be a good thing. Let me check it out. It's like you, you, you just, just to have to even think about going and, and exploring it. There's a little bit of faith. Um, and just like with the, the, with the aspirin, you don't know the, have you, if you've never had aspirin before, if you've had aspirin before, obviously then there's not faith involved per se. Um, but if you've never had aspirin before, and somebody says, take this, and like when you're in the monastic world life, people will come up with you with all kinds of like Ayurvedic or homemade remedies or concoctions. And there's like, Bhante, you should take this. And you're kind of like, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you don't know. It's like, whoa, OK, well, how much faith do I have in this person that they won't give me something that's going to harm me? I don't know. But no, this is. No, you know, when you are do, taking something without no, having the experience and knowing it for yourself, then, yeah, that's faith. Um, if I feel med more at peace after meditating for a while, is that considered faith in the Dhamma? Uh, no, I would say that's just ha that you've had a peaceful experience. Um, and hopefully that will give you encouragement to try it again. But if the next meditation is horrible... Your, your faith probably, whatever faith you developed in that two seconds of the first meditation is going to die in the second one, <laughs> right? You have to, so, you know, faith is something that develops over time, not just one thing. Okay. And Rick has a question. He says, as we mature in the practice, how do we know when we have overcome enough delusion so we can start trusting our own intuition? I have someone. Always a bad idea to trust your own intuition. I think that's <laughs> mm -hmm. as someone who was very attached to her own intuition in hindsight, this is the beauty actually of the Dhamma is that you can't really understand your delusion right here in this moment, but only in hindsight. Uh, so what's the saying in English? H hindsight? Hindsight is 2020. Is 2020. Yeah. So when you have this hindsight 2020 with the Buddhist lenses, you're like, whoa, was I delusional? Whoa, those instincts were totally wrong. Um, so I would say, <laughs> yeah, no, never trust your instincts and um, focus more on experiential knowledge. That is essentially it. Uh, it goes back to... Yeah, like what we were talking about whenever we quote actually Vanteji, um, Vanteji's uh, teacher, that, yeah, we just know, like nobody needs to tell us when we're hungry. Uh, we just know that we're hungry. So we don't have to trust our intuition that we're hungry, like, <laughs> or stuff like that. Mm, usually when we trust our intuition, we actually eat a bunch of junk food that gives us zero nutritional value and um, doesn't do anything to to actually make us full or, or give us anything, right? Um, but rather what we need to trust it is the teachings of the Buddha, practice them earnestly, and yeah, and then look at our experience. Is there a cessation of suffering? Then great, keep doing 
what you're doing. If there is increase of suffering, well, review the practice and go to someone who is um, ahead of you in the path and ask for questions. Okay. And then we have a question for Bhante Yutadamo, but Bhante Yutadamo is not here. So that means he, <laughs> you'll have to send this question to Bhante Yutadamo. This is Bhante Sudhasu, but they look very similar. <laughs> I actually, I look quite different from him. There are photos of me and him side by side, and you'll see that we actually look quite different from each other. When we started Buddhist I Insights, I think even Bhante Yutadamo thought it <laughs> were him. <laughs> Got confused, I'm kidding. Um. <laughs> I, I think Bhante Yutadamo is done with McMaster because he was doing that like six years ago. So okay, off topic. But anyway, so yeah, this person had faith back. that I was Bhante Yutadamo. <laughs> <laughs> but faith. on investigation, that faith was proven to be unfounded. It was an example of trusting one's intuition. Ah, <laughs> okay. And Rick asks, since our thinking is distorted by delusion, how do we know which Buddhist lineages or teachers to trust? This type of doubt has blocked full-hearted faith. Do not have faith in teachers. Do not have faith in lineages. Have faith in the Buddha and the Dhamma. And the Sangha. <laughs> in the ideal sangha but not in any one specific member of the sangha mm -hmm. okay anything else on that? No, i agree no? i agree okay that was easy uh asera Kos asks could it be that some traditions have misunderstood the buddhist teachings uh, all of them <laughs> all of them that's great. No, it's like I, 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 I will not say that there's one that like, oh, well, this tradition understands perfectly and the other traditions don't. I think all of them have misunderstandings and all of them have understandings. I think it's just a mixed bag. Yeah. Uh, Peter Gono, Gono one says, and there was an earthquake that happened when Buddha Gautama was born, right? Well, Buddha Gautama was never born. But the Bodhisatta Gotama was born and later became a Buddha. Um, but yeah, part of the traditional account is that there was an earthquake at that time, which I'm actually totally on board with, by the way. That's that's actually <laughs> one of the elements of his birth, which I'm completely fine with. From the shaking of the 10,000 world system. Um, actually, the only one I'm a little hesitant about is, is actually the thing about emerging from her side. That one I'm, I'm more inclined to believe he came out the way most babies come out. We're getting a little bit in the picking and choosing, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a thing. Just anyway, if it inspires faith, I would say if it inspires faith in your mind, then go for it. If it instills doubt, just shelf it. That's essentially what we want to do with um, in faith is a power. So we want the power of sadha, not the um disempowerment of doubt it's like oh where is there an earthquake that sounds improbable la, la, la. or like did he come out of the the side of the mouth or the foot or like didn't that. come out at all like you know there's just a whole mass of dukkha i like that i the disempowerment of doubt i like the way you put that That's good. <laughs> yeah i mean realistically it actually really doesn't matter yeah. what part of his mother's body he came out of what matters is that he attained awakening and he taught the rest of us how yeah. so future one says this is actually a little bit off topic maybe we can save this one for monk chat tomorrow yeah they can wait for monk chat doesn't really have anything to do with faith and doubt um let's see Actually, this is an interesting comment. Rahul says, I find it a little strange that the Buddha says not to take things on belief, such as the Kalama Sutta, and there are faith followers, and that's a thing he's okay with. Do you want to talk about this? No, I want to actually hear your perspective on oh. it. Yeah. He's okay with that. That's correct. So the, the point of the Kalama Sutta was not to just blindly believe whatever some random person tells you. So the Kalama people, the people of the case of Putians, the people of Kalama, uh, the Sutta actually starts with them lamenting. They go to the Buddha and they start lamenting like, so one week 
Bhante Bob comes and he says the world is flat. And then the next day, Ajahn Sarah comes and she says the world is round. And the next day, this other priest comes and he says the world is a trapezoid. And, and they're like, we just don't know who to believe. Everybody's telling us different things. Who do we believe? And the Buddha's like, well, probably not a good idea to just blindly believe any random guy who shows up in your village now, is it? So let's talk about what's not such a good basis for belief. And then let's talk about what you can do that will actually cultivate genuine wisdom. So this is where the Buddha is coming from. He's coming from people who are hesitant to invest blind belief in any particular spiritual teacher because they're getting so many different conflicting teachings from different teachers. So it's important to understand the origin of the Kalama Sutta mm -hmm. and the people he was talking to. Uh, but there are many, many other suttas where the Buddha talks about the transformative power of having faith in, in the Buddha, uh, and in particular, faith in the awakening of the Buddha, Tathagata Bodhisattva. Uh, and yeah, faith followers are people who their faith in the Buddha is so strong that they will commit themselves wholeheartedly to practicing the Dhamma. Even if they don't fully understand the Dhamma, they will commit themselves wholeheartedly to practicing it. And that kind of practice is then what leads to a genuine insight, which produces a understanding, an experiential understanding, and the unshakable faith that comes through experiential understanding. So that's why the Buddha is okay with it, because the faith of a faith follower is the kind of faith that leads to genuine wisdom. Uh, whereas just blindly believing whatever Bhante Bab says, that's not necessarily going to lead to awakening. Um, my apologies to everyone named Bob. Hmm. It's uh, just an example, Bunte whoever. So just believe, believing whatever Bunte whoever says is not necessarily going to lead to wisdom. Uh, but having strong enough faith in the Buddha that you're willing to commit yourself deeply to Buddhist practice, that will lead to genuine wisdom. So that's why he's okay with it. Anything well, else? A lot of misconceptions with the Kesa Putya Sutta, uh, otherwise known as the Kalama Sutta. Mm -hmm. Lots of context that people take it and use it for all kinds of different ways, but there's context is very important with that sutta. And reading the full sutta, not just the paragraph that everybody likes to put on uh, little quotes on Facebook and stuff. Yeah, the other thing is that, once again, the teachings of the Buddha are experiential. Um, and that is very much something that we can do immediately. Like Bhante was saying earlier in terms of the first noble truth of suffering. Like we, unfortunately, but <laughs> we all can experience suffering. Um, and so that is something that is essentially what the teachings of the Buddha are. The teachings of suffering, the cause of suffering, the end of suffering and the way out of suffering. It's not teachings, oh, well, just believe in random blah, 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 blah thing that is going to happen to you after you're dead or that you do this kind of ritual with blind faith and all of a sudden you're going to be pure and so forth. But rather looking at your experience, taking it, acknowledging your experiencing and putting a rem remedy, it's no different than having faith in a doctor. I mean, <laughs> literally, I mean, you can... I think it's um, it's a little bit different the entry point than what we normally associate with with faith, which is blind faith rather than um, experiential faith. And Anagarka Sarana asks, "How do you personally practice cultivating faith?" By practicing the Noble Eightfold Path, it works. That's what it that's what instills my mind with faith honestly mm -hmm. like wow like actually Bhante J I think uh spoke about it at the very beginning um that's what builds it up like literally you're like well I mean if I do sometimes you know we follow our intuition because um <laughs> we're just we have a strong habit of doing things that are unenlightened and we're like oh I'm pretty sure that if I accumulate things I'm going to be happy <laughs> And then you're unhappy. So then you take out of faith as a working hypothesis. You're like, how about I let go? How about instead of hoarding um, Chanel bags, I give 
Chanel bags out away or whatever it is that we care about, something that we really like and we think it's making us happy. How about we give it out? And then we're like, oh, wow, this feels so much better. How about instead of stuffing my face with food, I actually like make food for others and give it. Um, yeah. And you're like, wow, this really makes this delights the mind. How about I'm kind and and to to people instead of um, grumpy and blah, blah, blah. And you're like, oh, wow, this actually feels right. So when you go against the stream of your of your tendencies and you follow the stream of the Dhamma, then you actually see that the Buddha is always right. So that naturally um, infuses all your mind with faith. And Asereko asks why the reluctance to say that the Theravada lineage is the correct teachings of the Buddha when compared to the Mahayana. Well, first off, what do you mean by Theravada? Second, what do you mean by Mahayana? Third, why are you so convinced that they're teaching dramatically different things to the point where one is correct and the other is incorrect? A very instructive book on the topic of Theravada, by the way, is called uh, Sects and Sectarianism by Bhante Sujato, where he talks about where the origin of what we consider modern day Theravada, where it comes from. Uh, and of course, traditionally, Theravadans like to say that it, it comes directly from the Buddha and it's been completely unaltered for 2,500 years. It's the unalterable presentation of exactly what the Buddha said. Uh, history is a little bit different on this topic. Uh, rather, what we call the Theravada can be traced to a particular monastery, which was supported by the king of Sri Lanka about 1500 years ago, and which became set up by the king as the official repository of genuine orthodoxy. Uh, and other opinions and viewpoints were crushed uh, or considered to be incorrect. Uh, so what we call Theravada is more correctly the teachings of one particular monastery in Sri Lanka 1500 years ago. Uh, so um, I'm actually much more interested in what the Buddha taught rather than what a particular group of monks at a particular monastery in a particular country 1500 years ago taught. Uh, so do I practice Theravada? Not really. Uh, I practice the teachings of the Buddha, uh, which overlaps quite substantially with Theravada and also overlaps quite substantially with Mahayana. Uh, because ultimately what we're trying to do is to attain awakening. Uh, and attaining awakening means practicing the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, and it means examining everything we do in, in that lens. And so Asirika clarifies, by Theravada I mean the Pali Canon. Well, here again we have to be a little bit careful, because when we say Pali Canon, what do we mean? Uh, for example, the Abhidhamma Pitika is something that was clearly added hundreds of years later. So do we include that? Uh, parts of the Kurika Nikaya, such as the Apadanas and the Patisambhida Magga, also added hundreds of years later. Is that what we mean? Parts of the Vinya Pitika were clearly added hundreds of years later. Is that what we mean? Uh, as for the, the four main Nikayas, the, that's pretty reliable, but even there, there's a few fragments here and there which don't quite mesh with everything else. Uh, so that also is something where we actually need to apply the Buddha's own instructions, which is to carefully investigate and analyze what is the Dhamma and what is not the Dhamma. So the Buddha says, just as everywhere you taste the ocean, it tastes like salt. He says in the same way, everywhere you taste the Dhamma, it has the same flavor, the flavor of liberation. So in the same way, we should be constantly tasting every Dhamma that we receive and asking, is this salty or not? Uh, so 99% of the suttas in the in the four Nikayas um, taste pretty salty to me. Um, but there's a few fragments here and there where it's like, wait a minute, this one's bitter, this one's astringent, this one's sugary, something's a little bit off here. Uh, and similarly with the Mahayana teachings, a lot of it is pretty darn salty. Um, but there's a few bits here and there which are not particularly salty. And then I'm like, hmm, what is dish? Maybe not the Buddha's teachings. Uh, so, uh, you can't just blindly say uh, the Pali Canon is 100% absolutely correct, without doubt. I'll just believe everything in there without thinking about it. That's not Buddhism. Um, similarly, it's not good to just outright reject all the Mahayana stuff just because it's not in the Pali Canon. 
Now that's also not Buddhism, that's just dogmatism. But rather we should always be closely examining what's salty in the sense of what tastes like liberation, what tastes like awakening. And you'll find lots of stuff in the Mahayana that tastes like awakening. And unfortunately, you'll also find a few random bits here and there in the Pali Canon, which don't, don't taste very salty, you know, which is a bit sad, but that's history for you. Okay. What comes to mind is, only this is true. Everything else is wrong. One of my favorite <laughs> quotes from the Pali Canon of, not, of what not to do. <laughs> And we have a question from Rainbow. It says, are Buddha and Kothohu the perfect opposites? One is known for being awakened. The other is known as eternal slumber. What is the meaning of this? Actually not that up to date on Cthulhu mythos. Are you, are you into Lovecraftian uh, I don't know cosmology? Sl slumber, no. Okay. I just know it's a big octopus or something. I have no idea. Uh, okay, I probably, probably actually do, do know more about it than... <laughs> So as the standing resident expert on Lovecraftian cosmology, which I actually don't know very much. Um, <laughs> yeah, if Cthulhu is the eternally slumbering one, then yeah, that's that's definitely not the Buddha. Cthulhu is also defined as utterly evil, by the way. So we have the Buddha, utterly morally perfect and completely awake. And you have Cthulhu, utterly evil and completely asleep. So you might actually be onto something there and saying that they're polar opposite. Um, yeah, don't follow Cthulhu. Mm -hmm. Follow the Buddha. If it's always sleeping, how can it do evil? These, these are sleep part of the evil. Lovecraftian sleep mysteries. Sleep I sleep think Manny's evil. question is for Mount Chat. Right. Uh, yes. Yeah. So Manny, that's a great question. Um, but this question is not on topic. So maybe better to bring it to Monk Chat. Tomorrow evening, 7.30 p.m. New York City time. Same thing. Time, same place. All your Cthulhu <laughs> questions tomorrow. <laughs> Maybe I'll, I'll study up on, on Lovecraftian cosmology in the meantime. Probably not, to be honest. I, ain't nobody got time yeah, for actually, that. Yeah, actually, though, so the Cthulhu was a mock shot question, I think. No? That's correct. Yeah. Um, let's see. This also, I think, is monk chatty. We're getting a lot of monk chat questions Although this here. has to, well. No, nah, monk chat. Asayriko, this is a good question for Monk Chat tomorrow evening, same time. Um, Andy, also I Monk Chat got... questions. <laughs> I think we're we're just getting into a lot of Monk Chat questions. Ah, this is doubt and faith. Ah, okay. So Asayriko says, if the Pali Canon is not the precise teachings, how do you know you are actually practicing what the Buddha taught? Asayriko. Hey, distracted sorry so if the Pali Canon is not the precise teachings how do you know you're actually practicing what the Buddha taught I think actually you said extensively about that um, so once again instead of getting into only this is true everything else is wrong uh, but rather um, investigating what do you actually believe in what does this even mean so um, we tend to fixate that we <laughs> whatever we have um, is the actual truth and everyone else is wrong. But sometimes we get so confused and we're actually saying exactly the same thing. Uh, we were talking about that earlier. So sometimes I actually think about it in terms of more um, attitudes of mind, qualities of mind that we have to develop rather than, um, rather than these fragments of quotes that we then think are the truth right we tend to relate to texts and books as going like okay well this is the truth so let me quote um Nikaya, blah 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 page blah blah blah, blah. and um there is no understanding of what we're even regurgitating it just becomes a regurgitation of words and that has the same value of every pretty much yeah that it's not dhamma it doesn't have the flavor of Dhamma, but rather when we start understanding, we start investigating our mind through the teachings that are given to us, whether they're Travada, Mahayana, etc., or also even Catholic, or else, though you can get very confused, um, <laughs> stick to Buddhism. But, you know, if you're actually a really advanced practitioner, um, there are many advanced, incredibly advanced practitioners, like Ajahn Buddha Daza, for example, he would do that. 
He would also take teachings of other different spiritual traditions and match them. They all have the flavor of Dhamma. But he was capable of doing that. The reason why it's not recommended for ordinary folks is because um, really advanced practitioners have developed that flavor of Dhamma, that uh, they can recognize the saltiness of something. And so that comes um, from, yeah, you know, it's no different actually than than food, for example. <laughs> if you come from Italy, you know what Italian food tastes like. If you come from India, you know what Indian food tastes like. Even in all the different varieties, there are a million different types of Indian food. There are a million different types of Italian food, but they all have the same exact taste. And when you come to America, I don't know about the Indian restaurant because I'm not Indian. Uh, so to me, it just tastes like Indian food. But the Italian-American food, I'm sorry, Dante, because I know you're Italian. <laughs> but it has a different flavor. So I can recognize where it, the parts that come from Italy. And I can also understand this other stuff is actually coming from, I don't even know, maybe the connect, the interaction of Italian people moving here and meeting the Germans and meeting, I don't know, the, the Brits who liked a lot of dairy. And so then they decided to put 10 different types of cheeses in the same um, thing and mix it with cream. We don't do that in Italy, you know? So why is that? <laughs> so uh, it's because I ate, I grew up with Italian food. I ate it all my life. So I have that taste. I have that flavor. I can... Uh, suck it up. It's the same thing with the flavor of Dhamma. So the more we experience it, and it doesn't mean reading a bunch of books, huh? although that can help a little bit, but really it's practicing, really doing this investigation um, in um, formal meditation, in study, in going about our day um, when we're relating to people, immersing yourself in Dhamma. So that's why someone like Ajahn Buddha Daza is so fantastic that can actually find this flavor everywhere. And I see a couple other questions online which are not related to the topic, but which are still great questions. So if you can bring those to Monk Chat tomorrow evening at the same time, uh, we'll be happy to answer all of your other Buddhist questions. Um, so if there's any final questions, either from... I think the one before. This one? Wasn't that? It's yeah, a little faith. off topic, eh? And faith towards the Dhamma. No, no, no. Okay. okay. That's good. This one says, is it fair to use the 37 factors of awakening in the Gotami Sutta to guide one's practice and faith towards the Dhamma? Yeah, I mean, the 37 factors of awakening are pretty standard Buddhist principles that apply to basically everything and every Buddhist tradition everywhere. Um, and that's a pretty good guide to what's the Dhamma and what's not the Dhamma. So if something matches up with the 37 Bodhipakya Dhammas, then it's probably Buddhism. Uh, and if it contradicts the 37 Bodhipakya Dhammas, it's probably not Buddhism. So I think that's a pretty good guide. Uh, so then if you look at the Gotami Sutta in that lens, then you'll find the Gotami Sutta, Sutta line, uh, well, it depends on which Gotami Sutta you mean, by the way, there's more than one. When you know for um, yourself that yeah. these factors. Yeah. Yeah. So that Gotami Sutta, yes, that one is, is actually very much in line with the 37 factors of awakening. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's a pretty fair basis. Yeah. I was actually going to bring up Gotami Sutta in relation mm -hmm. to the other one. Like, even at the time, you read the suttas, even at the time of the Buddha, like, they're countering, like, other monks, and, like, the monks have wrong understanding of the teachings, and, like, <clears throat> the whole, like, even the, the Buddha knew that even while he's still alive, that the, the teachings are going to be kind of misunderstood and distorted, and, and that's why he gave things, like, the Gotami Sutta, like, you know, reflecting on... Um, this practice you're doing, is it leading to dispassion? Is it lessening your greed, hatred, and delusion? Is it doing this? Is it doing that? Well, then it's that's my teaching, right? So mm -hmm. he, he, the Buddha gives us these kind of frameworks to, to judge what you're doing by knowing full well that the teachings over time were going to be, you know, misunderstood or, or you know, you get to the point where 2,600 years later is like, well, how do I know this is true or not? We'll put it into practice mm. and see what it does. Mm. Great. And I think this will be our last question for the night. Amir says, how do we sometimes overcome doubt about rebirth? 
Well, I would recommend to first off reflect what is rebirth fundamentally talking about? Fundamentally, it's talking about choices and causality. It's talking about how we make choices, which then shape what our experience is going to be both in the present moment and in future moments. And it means that what we're experiencing now is shaped by the choices we've made in the past. Uh, for example, right now I'm a Buddhist monk and that's because in the past many years ago, I decided to uh, pursue monastic life. Uh, right now I'm, I'm wearing this robe because earlier today I decided to put on this robe. So those are very clear examples of how we're currently experiencing the effects of past choices. And in this moment, we can make choices, which then shape what we experience in the future. So this is what rebirth is fundamentally based upon. It's based upon the simple recognition that our current experience is causally produced by past choices, and our current choices are going to causally produce future experiences. Rebirth is just a natural extension of what we can directly observe moment by moment every single day. It's just applying it on a larger scale. The same causality that you observe moment to moment, day to day, month to month, year to year, that exact same causality you can also observe life to life. It's just exactly the same principle applied on a larger scale. I would like to ask you, how did you overcome the doubt that you only live once? Mm. So that was actually something <laughs> that was really interesting to me. I'll tell you a little story of when um, we had started Buddhist Insights actually together with Pante Sutaso, and there was a friend of ours uh, who, or a friend of mine anyway, that was, um, I didn't know was Christian. Uh, and he never came to do meditation um, retreats at the place that we were running in New York City because clearly, well, we have Buddhist monks. So clearly, you know, it was a religious place. Clearly it was Buddhist. So he decided to go to instead a Goenka retreat, um, the so-called Vipassana retreats. And so from Goenka G. And um, we meet afterwards and he tells me, he had gone there because they were advertised as secular places. So we, um, non-religious places. So we meet and I'm like, oh, how did the retreat go? And he's like, oh, it was like terrible. Like the person, like I, I felt like they were brainwashing me. And I was like, oh, wow. I was quite shocked to have such a feedback because usually people have really positive feedback about uh, going to retreats. And uh, then I'm like, why? What? What did they do that you felt brainwashed? And he's like, oh, well, the guy couldn't stop talking about rebirth. And <laughs> in that moment, <laughs> I started laughing because it occurred to me that Gwenkaji was Indian. And, um, you know, even though he was not born Buddhist, he came from India, where essentially the secular version <laughs> that he was presenting of Buddhism was inspired by his by the religion essentially that was there which also has karma and rebirth so it occurred to me in that moment that you only live once was actually not a secular concept at all all my life I thought that YOLO was secular until I realized that you only live once or you go to heaven or hell, or purgatory, if you're in Italy. <laughs> we added a third choice. And then the secular, essentially, you just remove that. And um, But literally, the, you only live once is a Judeo-Christian Judeo concept. It's a, an Abrahamic concept. So the fact that I was blindly believing and you only live once was what was really interesting to me that up until that moment, I had never ever questioned why I actually ever believed in YOLO. Mm -hmm. So this is very connected to the um, doubt or the investigation that we were talking, the one that is beneficial of investigating. Why do we believe in what we believe rather than why are we doubting what we think we're doubting? Thank you. And that's the last question. So I think we can go ahead and end at this point with three sadhus. 
Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. And we'll see you tomorrow for uh, sutta study in the morning and then monk chat in the evening.